Hello Team Frog and welcome to Sunday Frog Radio for Sunday the 3rd of June 2018. I'm Froggy Frog 9000 thanks for joining me. Let's go through a few things that are on my uh, list in front of me here. Uh, the summary for today's video mission creation in the mission editor that'll be available soon for five dollar and above patreons uh, on, on patreon so that basically means uh, that you'll you'll be able to look at some detailed instructions from start to finish on how to use the mission editor <coughs> in Isle 2 Sturmovic Battle of Stalingrad, Battle of Moscow, Battle of Kuban and soon enough Battle of Bodenplatt not in this one not in Cliffs of Dover and not in Isle 2 1946 just to clarify so I'm basically in the latest generation of Isle 2 how to use the mission editor it's pretty difficult if you're naturally engineering systems orientated you'll be able to pick it up I don't know if you'll be able to translate that across as a teacher to others though I'm not so much of a boffin um, so I am pretty much the lowest common denominator so I'll be but I figured it out I figured out the mission editor and I'll be communicating my findings to you if you want to know how to use the mission editor become a five dollar patron on patreon of the froggy frog 9000 channel and then soon enough you'll be able to see those details instru detailed instructions on how to make a mission uh, how to put down aircraft how to set the altitude the speed the track how to set the behavior how to set the ordnance how to set the weather how to set the time uh, how to locate the mission editor because it's not actually in the il2 game it's external to it how to switch between the mission editor and um, and the game <coughs> and lots of uh, tips and tricks that I've learned through bitter experience through my hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of toiling with the mission editor all that knowledge can be condensed down and can be yours if you become a five dollar patron on patreon patron of the froggy frog 9000 channel the other thing is t-shirts uh, I'm progressing along with my uh, Adobe Illustrator aircraft profile design those t-shirts are available on the website froggyfrog9000.com my website you can buy them there uh, it's for US residents only they're fifteen dollars thereabouts I think it includes free shipping for members of Amazon Prime uh, so that is a good deal to get yourself a Warbird t-shirt if you want a t-shirt of a Mustang for example go to Froggy Frog 9000 pay you 15 it'll be sent to you and Bob's your uncle so that's t-shirts DCS you can see DCS in front of you just here it looks pretty darn clear doesn't it I had an issue with it not being clear I've got an Nvidia GPU graphics card in the old parlance and um, it was really getting me down that DCS was blurry I didn't play DCS very much because of the fact that the terrain and the objects on the train such as trucks and tanks and personnel were blurry <coughs> other aircraft were blurry as well when looking from inside the aircraft f1 view like we've got on the screen now it wasn't blurry but if you went f2 view you went external view everything was blurry i managed to solve that by going to settings and uh depth of field there's a, a setting called depth of field you can set it to off bokeh or something uh and something else simple or something anyways you set it to off 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 set it to off and then you get clear dcs tip for young players then I had an issue once that was solved I used Dixitory the Japanese rec screen record program Dixitory that's a 50 US dollar program uh, I used that for DCS and other games because uh, it doesn't have synchronization issues which sometimes uh, Nvidia GeForce experience does have that issue with certain games other than IL2 uh, so I went to use DCS with Dixitory running and it kept crashing that didn't happen today so whatever was the gremlin it's been s it, it rectified itself fixed itself the F-18 and the Persian Gulf map are out on uh, DCS I think the F-18 is out I know the Persian Gulf maps out I'm thinking of purchasing the Persian Gulf map I'm a bit short of funds at the moment because I'm moving house completely moving house if you've done that before you know that it's a logistical nightmare and it takes up a lot of your time and energy and that sort of thing but I'm thinking of getting the Persian Gulf map for the express purpose of making some 
uh, cinematics related to the probably the best fighter ace in the world ever, who was uh, Marseille, Hans Joachim Marseille, Hans Joachim Marseille, Marseille, French surname, Marseille was a German, He his dad was a fighter pilot in World War One who flew Fokker D7s, and then Marseille flew Messerschmitt BF109s in World War Two. Marseille was known as an artist, uh, as, a, as an air combat artist. His, his colleagues described him as an artist. He was very undisciplined. He listened to a lot of jazz on the gramophone or whatever. His favourite song was the rumba. And um, he had fairly long hair. He was always out partying with the ladies. He had no discipline whatsoever. And... Um, that was Marseille, and he was an amazing ace. He died fairly early in the war, and he died in North Africa. So that's the reason why I want to get the Persian Gulf map, because it can pretty much mimic North Africa, and I can make some Hans Jochen Marseille uh, videos, cinematic videos, using the BF109 K4 with the Marseille skin, that iconic uh, desert camo with the blotches on it. That, that's got an interesting nose art insignia that looks like a, a man being eaten by a lion. If, you, if you've seen that one, you know the one. <laughs> uh, I think that's Marseille's plane. He didn't fly a 109K4. That came out after he'd passed away. But anyways, Marseille died not in combat, but when he was flying along and he had engine trouble in one of the earlier BF109 models. And the I think the engine started to smoke, started to burn oil or something. It was a known fault that they fixed up after Marseille's death. So he died basically of a uh, an engineering error, rare though they are, in the German aircraft. And, uh, well, what happened is he bailed out, and it seems as though... Well, they know that he bailed out and he never pulled his chute. He never deployed his parachute. So what probably happened there is he bailed out, hit the tail, got knocked unconscious, and never pulled the chute. Something like that. That's the general consensus. It may also be that he lost consciousness in the in the slipstream, in the airstream of um, burning oil smoke. Whatever it was, he was probably I would say he was from what I've from what I understand, Marseille was probably the best ace ever. Even better than Booby. Uh, because, um, which is Hartman, Eric Hartman, his nickname Booby, which I think means baby, because he, he was sort of a younger person, uh, or, or he had the appearance of being young. Uh, Eric Hartman, his kills were something like 350 aerial victories, mostly on the Eastern Front uh, against uh, Soviet planes. Marseille, all of his victories were, I believe, were in... I don't know if all of his victories were in North Africa. Probably they were on, uh, in the Battle of Britain as well. But Marseille basically flew against the RAF and probably against Americans too, but mostly against the RAF. And uh, all of Marseille's victories, therefore, pretty much, were against the RAF, were against Kitty Hawks and Spitfires and Blenheims and whatever else he could get his hands on, which are much more challenging, generally speaking, than fighting Soviet fighters such as the Polycarpov I-16 and that sort of thing that were outclassed by that stage of, of, of uh, aircraft evolution. Um, the thing about Marseille, if I can just try and condense the essence of why he was such a special fighter pilot, is, uh, for example, his ground crew started counting his ammunition that he had left over when he returned from a mission because what had happened is he'd go out and he'd shoot down five planes in a mission and it turned out that he'd used some insanely low amount of ammunition per aircraft, something like, you know, I don't know, like six bullets per aircraft to, to destroy five aircraft in a flight. He was incredibly amazing, like he was a, a robot. He was superhuman. Marseille would use a handful of bullets per aircraft and he'd land with a lot of ammunition left over and he'd destroyed, you know, four or five aircraft in a flight. So... Marseille was um, the other thing about Marseille is he could he could hit targets very far away, like he, normally normally pilots would be like, nah, don't shoot, you're too far away. 
the angle the deflection angle is too much it's not worth it you waste your ammo Marseille had actually hit targets under those conditions Marseille was incredibly good at shooting he'd hit something that was too far away he'd hit it he'd hit something that was at a very high deflection angle he'd, he'd hit it and shoot it down and um, I, th I think he used to get defensive circular uh, formations of Kitty Hawks or Blenheims or whatever. This is all in North Africa because they'd see the one and nines coming. They knew they couldn't uh, outperform them, so they'd get into a defensive circle. And Marseille had a tactic of flying a straight line through the centre of this defensive circle, diving down on the first aircraft that he could intercept, so basically at a right angle, shooting it down, and then as he's in the dive, pulling up out of the dive to the other side of the circle intercepting another aircraft on the other side of the circle and shooting that and that's how we could take out two aircraft in quick succession uh, even though there was one of those defensive circles and the idea of the defensive circle was um, traditionally you'll get on someone's tail and shoot them down Marseille didn't get on the tail of anyone in that defensive circle he just simply cut across the circle and he had the shooting ability to shoot at a right angle and to judge the, the distance pretty well precisely. I get the feeling Marseille, Marseille was sort of, if you watch Marseille in action, it pretty would, pretty much would have been like watching Rod, Roger Federer play tennis, like someone that just had incredible uh, superlative talent and skill with uh, accuracy and precision and power and um, anticipation and all, all the things that go into making uh, an expert at something like shooting down another plane in World War Two, or playing tennis for that matter. So that's Marseille in a nutshell, and that's why I'm going to at some point get the Persian Gulf map. Uh, there could be some disruption to the channel, as I say, I'm moving house. I'm moving house in a month, so not quite yet, but soon enough they may, there may well be some disruption to the channel in the form of no videos for a while. I've got ways of avoiding that and different internet options, but um, yeah, we'll see how we go. Hopefully that'll be minimal disruption. What's happening with Battle of Kalash feature film? It's on hold. Uh, I'm still figuring out the format, uh, i.e. the mix of uh, flight and ground combat. And I'm still trying to figure out the best way to incorporate, or even if I should incorporate, um, uh, DCS, uh, not DCS, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, liberation, Iron Front, Iron Front Liberation, 1944, in Armor Three. Seeing, basically, seeing if I want to incorporate Armor Three into my Clash vid. Yeah, the last one took three months, pretty much full time to make. the The next one definitely is going to include more aerial combat. The first uh, Battle of Clash, the lead up to, that didn't involve very much aerial combat this one will involve heaps of aerial combat partly because the battle has begun uh, but also because um, I want to include more so um, Battle of Clash it's not off the table it's but it's um, it's on hold at this time unfortunately uh, that's it in a nutshell for this Sunday Frog Radio edition I've been Froggy Frog 9000 thank you very much for watching watching uh, just to recap some of the main points, um, you can get a t-shirt of my design from froggyfrog9000.com such as a profile of the P51D Mustang. Yeah, it's through Amazon. I believe shipping is free for members of Amazon Prime and it's within the United States only. That's if you want a t uh, aircraft profile t-shirt. Uh, and there, oh yes, a, an important point about that is that I'll be I'll be adding more and more t-shirts as time goes on my intention is to make an, an aircraft profile of every single warbird pretty much that there was of world war ii starting with the classics such as the mustang and the spitfire and the fw and the bf 109 and going right through and also i'm very keen on making aviation profile art of what you'd call the 1946 jets and rockets for that matter uh, even maybe including the um, the the, the uh, I don't know artillery rockets like the V2, the buzz bomb. The I guess that's the V1. I think there was an A4, which was a gigantic rocket, multi-stage. Um, I might make some profile art of those as well, which will make their way to and end up on t-shirts. But particularly aircraft like the HS1, the HE162, 
Salamander, as it was codenamed. Uh, that single jet engine, humpback, tricycle undercarriage, um, H-tail, designed by Heinkel, the HE162, make a profile of that. The ME163 Comet, the jet fighter. Um, of course, the ME262, and a whole bunch of other ones, a whole bunch of other 1946 designs. The TA183, the Messerschmitt ME1101. These were jets that pretty much the MiG-15 and to a lesser extent the F-86 Sabre are direct copies or heavily inspired by those two aforementioned uh, German jet fighters. So there's those and furthermore there's BMW flying saucer looking uh, fighter planes. There's all sorts that was developed but never the, the, there was a prototype but was never, de uh, never developed in 1946 so be looking at making some profile art of those particular prototypes and plans uh, if you want to see more of that uh, keep visiting froggyfrog9000.com and um, as the weeks progress you'll see more and more there and um, that's something I'm that's a project that I'm looking forward to sinking my teeth into and really getting stuck into that and before I forget some other types of jet planes that I'll be making as profile art that'll go on t-shirt format the Arado AR-234 jet light bomber and reconnaissance aircraft twin engine jet the Arado AR-234 um, all the different variations of the 262 um, and of the HE-162 some of them had reverse swept wings and all sorts of different wing configurations gull wings and that um, There, there was a uh, the Nata. The Nata has it's a rocket-powered interceptor that also has rocket pods for for many rockets that it fires in the nose. I really like the Nata. I'll be making a profile of the Nata. Uh, I mean, there were the I guess in prototype format there were tons of different jets and some rockets, and surprisingly, many of them were made by BMW. Um, progressing, progressing right through to the very sort of um, mythological aircraft at the very end of the war, things that can't necessarily be substantiated. Uh, if you, if and basically what I'm saying is that um, in addition to those hypothetical and real jets that were produced or were about to be produced in 1945 onwards, there was also the emergence of the concept of the flying saucer. And from what I can tell, the first like if if you ask yourself the fundamental question, where does the flying saucer originate? According to what I can see, it originated with the what's called the Hanibu, which is a a, um, a a Luftwaffe flying saucer, and there's some actual prototype drawings of a it's not a Hanibu but of a BMW fighter aircraft that has kind of like spinning rotors, and um, the pilot sits in the center of this spinning rotor disc type aircraft. So that's, that's something that's substantiatable. And then there's the Hanibu, which is, there are, on, on the internet, there are blueprints of the Hanibu that look legit. Um, they're, they're on an old document that's got typewriter writing on it, and it's from the 1940s, and it's a schematic, basic schematic of the, like the profile on the top-down view of a flying saucer. And um, it's this Luftwaffe, document essentially of a flying saucer so that to my knowledge is the origin of the flying saucer like where does it begin where does the flying saucer myth begin as far as I can tell it begins at the end of World War Two with the Hanibu so anyways I'm very fascinated with that subject so you've got this progression from the beginning of World War Two with the very basic BF 109 and um, 
DO-17 flying pencil, you know, the fighter and the bomber and that sort of thing. And this progresses right through the war to till you get fledgling jets like the 262, fledgling rockets like the ME-163. And then further than that, you get things like the BMW flying disc fighter aircraft. And then beyond that, you've got um, sort of semi, uh, m well, semi-metaphysical, totally mythological um, final stage evolution. Oh yeah, and I missed a step in this evolutionary chronology, which is the V2 rocket and the, and the V1 buzz bomb. You know, we're getting into some really high-tech areas here. And then beyond that, you've got the myth of the honeyboo, the, the German flying saucer. So long story short, there'll be those kind of aircraft included in my aircraft profile, profile art. So yeah, anyways, that really is it uh, for this edition of Sunday Frog Radio. I'm Froggy Frog 9000 on YouTube. Like, become a subscriber of the channel, smash the like button, uh, share with your friends and family, and um, consider becoming a patron of the channel, either on Patreon or through Dogecoin or Bitcoin or what have you. Chuck us a few bucks for a cup of coffee now and then. It really does help with motivation and things like that. Um, and finally, uh, visit froggyfrog9000.com, froggyfrog9000.com, and have a look at my aviation profile art and my videos that I've posted there. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Sunday. Bye for now.